Hi, welcome to Got Questions? I'm Parker, friend and right-hand man to Dr. William DiPaolo. Will is an immunologist and he's currently studying the gut microbiome up at the University of Washington in Seattle. Will's actually been studying the microbiome since before it was even called the microbiome, so for about 10 years now. Will is center director for the Center for Microbiome Sciences and Will is the director of Center for Microbiome Sciences and Therapeutics, CMIST. And in addition to that, he runs his own lab. So in the second part of this episode on polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFAs, Will gives a lot of really fascinating detail about bacteria of choice for this study, which is Yersinia enterocolitica, which can cause a few foodborne illness in humans. So essentially what this bacteria does is it paralyzes the immune system. The bacteria will construct a little tiny needle, as well put it, and inject immune cells with virulence factors, which are molecules that a bacteria will create to um, cause disease in a host cell. So those nasty little Yersinia enterocolitica virulence factors will then prevent the cell from phagocytosis, which is the process of ingesting a pathogen and essentially killing it. So the fact that the Yersinia does this and at what temperature it does this is pretty important to understanding the project. And Will's gonna set that up in this part of the episode. So with that, I give you my friend and boss, Dr. Will DiPaolo. Yeah. But, um, but we became interested in these polyunsaturated fatty acids because of the interaction with the gut. And, and I think that something, so we attend, intentionally, I would wanted to start doing projects on um, sort of the microbiome in um, deficient diets, like trying to like look at how public health. Um, deficient. Deficient right. diet, yeah, like okay. protein deficient, and like sort of like a malnourished and malnutrition. Mm -hmm. That's the model that I wanted to go at, and we were thinking about that because of like studies in Africa looking at sort of vaccines and vac oral vaccinations in um, children who are undernourished, and I thought that could be a really interesting project. But it was a little bit deviating from the lab at the time of what like we were studying, and to like kind of show consistency, we decided to start working on and you know we definitely um, want to do a microbiome component of this, but we work also on infections and the lab has um, a lot, my experience is a lot with um, bacterial infections, both like diarrheal and um, uh, more um, sinister like bubonic plague. Yeah. And, um, and so, so we decided to do, um, you know, we saw the statistic lately that um, foodborne illness in, um, affects 48 million people in the United States every year. So that's like 50 million yeah, people. Yeah, I remember her presentation. I was sort of surprised at that. Yeah. And um, it leads to like 128,000 hospitalizations and like over 3,000 deaths each year. And that's in um, countries that are like developed, right? So like, or I mean, that's in both, but like in less developed countries, like food and water borne diarrheal diseases can kill 2 million people. So, you know, that is telling you that these, like, we don't have a lot of, um, like, there's still countries out there that a salmonella or like an E. coli infection could actually do pretty big damage to a community. Yeah. So you're talking about 1.9 million people in the, well, in the less developed countries. And then um, here in the US, probably about, uh, you know, I mean, worldwide, it's 48 million. That's a lot of people. That's so. A lot. Um, we study one type of bacteria specifically in the lab called Yersinia enterocolitica. It's a foodborne pathogen that's a proteobacteria, um, and it causes a, basically it's, um, you get it from um, contaminated food or water. It's actually very, um, it's a self-limiting diarrhea disease. So like 14 days of being on the toilet and you're usually done with it. Um, and then it kind of goes, so it's self-limiting, like seven to 14 days. Okay. That's a long time. And, yeah. And it gives you like your lymph nodes and your mesenteric or your your gut area, the, mes the mesenteric lymph nodes will swell up. And, um, and most people can pass that um, infection okay. They'll mount an immune response eventually, but in um, immunocompromised individuals and children, it can be lethal. And so um, it's actually growing in um, 
I think there's a lot more infections with your Sinandro clinica than are actually reported because it's not screened in hospitals um, as one of the agents of, you know, they screen for like E. coli. So it's occurring more often? Right, right. I think it's occurring. I, I mean, and, or, okay. they say that it's occurring more often, but, but it's just un, like it's not being identified, but it's out right. there in communities. And that um, there's a disproportionate amount of um, Yersinia infection found in children less than a year old. So it's also something that's affecting younger children, um, infants a little bit more. Oh, so wow. Yersinia is interesting because um, it's a relative, Yersinia enterocolitica is a relative of plague. And that's, so I used to work on plague and then we, I switched over to diarrhea because it was more exciting um, <laughs> than plague. And so, um, it's very similar to plague though, um, Yersinia enterocolitica, what happens is that it, at room temperature, it's like pretty docile. So it's, um, it does not, it's basically, um, it can proliferate and it can grow at, at room temperature, but it doesn't really have any of its sort of negative virulence factors turned on. It needs a temperature change. So like, as soon as you ingest it. Okay. Uh, then, I'm now understanding her project a little bit yeah. more. And I never yeah. understood why the temperatures. I was like, yeah. I don't. Okay. Yeah, so uh, room temperature is more proliferative, and then when you right. ingest it, uh, your body temperature is um, 98.6 so Fahrenheit or like 37 Celsius, something like that. So yeah. when upon that temperature shift, what happens is the proliferation, the, the bacterial growth goes down, and um, and um, it turns on genetic elements inside of itself that make it very virulent. So basically your cinea, um, so salmonella, for instance, will get inside your cells, like it will go into your cells and hide out and proliferate and burst them. Your cinea doesn't do that. Your cinea stays on the outside of your cells, but it takes like a little needle, it puts together a needle and it puts it on the outside of its membrane. And then that needle will go and poke oh, all your cells and then it causes, it injects these factors into the cells that then cause them to have apoptosis, which is they'll pop oh. and die. It can cause them to um, be unable to um, phagocytose or ingest bacteria. So it basically um, freezes them. Like it like basically like causes them to freeze up. It, it affects their cytoskeleton so they can't phagocytose. Oh, so it will wow. cause, yeah, so it will cause like it blocks um, enough transcription. So like you can't get inflammatory cytokines to um, be produced by cells. So basically it paralyzes the immune system in a number of different ways. And, um, and then because the, the immune system is paralyzed then it can proliferate. Right. And then eventually- Cause you've you know, got no defense now. You get a limited defense. And so that's or why- Or limited defense. Limited defense. And, and that eventually takes time, but you'll neutrophils will come in and the neutrophils tend to take care of your cinia pretty well. Um, and other things like that, antibodies and, and those sort of things. So, um, but basically that temperature change is what causes your cinea to be virulent. And so um, using, thinking about um, foodborne illness and thinking about how it's increasing in Western, well, um, so foodborne illness and death to like death caused by foodborne illness is increasing in Western countries, which is weird because we have- I'm sorry, I'm just gonna put him in his kettle and he's making me, Crazy. Okay. Hey, you. Come here. So I'll keep talking. Um, yeah. So while um, while mm -hmm. infections that like infections leading to death are increasing in Western countries, and we also have this increase in um, diets that are twenty to one um, higher with omega sixes, we decided to kind of look at um, how this um, fatty acid, how omega six specifically, might affect your cinia. Um, the enterocolitica. So how would it affect a gut-borne um, diarrhea-causing pathogen? Because it might come in contact with that. And, um, and, and then will that, you know, change it? And, and not looking at it in the context of our guts, but doing this all in vitro, um, just looking at bugs with the uh, food um, constituents with the omega-6s. So we used an omega-6 called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid, um, has been shown actually to be bactericidal against some gram positive species. So like um, Pseudomonas or Neisseria, um, it, it's been shown to kill them and it can actually reduce the growth of probiotic bacteria like lactobacillus. So, it, so arachidonic acid, while it can still kill some bacteria, it's having a negative effect on 
our own gut bacteria. I have one just, um, is this information that Denise gave in the talk that I just never really picked up on? Like, was I, she I, saying things like this that you're I saying right now? I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't remember specifically now, but it's, okay. it's in the paper that we're writing, so. Sure, so. okay, because I feel like I just have a better understanding of this project in general, and because that point right there about the probiotics and what they are rachidonic acid, is that how you say it, um, is doing, um, I never, I don't remember that piece of information. Yeah, yeah, no, it actually can um, reduce the growth and adherence of probiotic species to the gut. Um, and then um, it's also, um, it, so that's all with gram positive. So gram positive bacteria have like a, um, have like a gram positive shell on them, whereas gram negative bacteria are coated with LPS. And so gram negative bacteria, nobody's really studied uh, acid on gram negative bacteria. Um, a little bit of stuff that's out there on E. coli and maybe a Sinato or a Balmani, which is another uh, hospital born sort of infection. Oh. It can do some things on that, but the, the literature is really not so detailed. And so um, Yersinia is a gram negative bacteria. So we thought, let's just do this and see, um, you know, nobody's really looking exactly at like how this omega-6, if it actually does anything to the pathogen, if it's doing anything, if it could help the pathogen grow or if it could kill the pathogen or whatever. So we decided to just go ahead. So and people are looking at the omega-6. They're just looking at it from a different they're looking at it yeah during infection like and so they're looking at it like inside the host like the host response and in, in, in some cases in other cases they're looking at different types of bacteria and so then than what we were looking at so okay. we decided to kind of just basically take yersinia and then grow it at two different temperatures we grew it at um room temperature where it proliferates and then we grew it at um body temperature like body temperature and that's where it like turns on its virulence and it's a nasty little needle thing and um and and then we added omega-6 um at a concentration that was um equal to what you might find in the blood or um so we we did some research and we found that so we still we and we did a dose response and, and we found that the the best response was actually the amount that we would probably be exposed to um in serum concentration so it's a physiological concentration of omega-6 that we or uh, omega-6 which is a rachidonic acid right we and so, um, and then we basically just looked to see what happened. Yersinia enterocolitica. Nasty little bugger, huh? Pretty sneaky, that little tiny meal. So to be honest, I was never very interested in this project. It seemed like there were a lot of pieces, um, too many parts to keep track of, or that I would, I suppose, bother to keep track of. Uh, but having access to well one-on-one -on -one like this, it's really been a lot of fun. And I can see how simple and elegant this project really is. Um, so now with this basic background that we have about the uh, bacteria and how it behaves in this next episode, or rather the next part of this episode on PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, Will is going to explain what happens to the bacteria uh, at, at different temperatures, at room temperature and at body temperature, and in the presence of omega-6 at room and at body temperature. So really what's being asked in this project, what Denise and Will wanted to know was, does the infection from this bacteria, the Yersinia enterocolitica, does it actually worsen if there is omega-6 in the system? So definitely check out this third part next week about this project to find out. And if you've got questions for Will, have you got questions? Um, please let me know in the comments section below or on our contact page on the podcast website, yourgutquestions.com, or send me an email at aparker at medicine.washington.edu. See ya.